So this is a, a very mixed audience. So I hope I made a, a presentation that can be, well, if not understood by any, everyone, then at least not bore everyone. So I also, my plan, it doesn't always work, but my plan is to be very short so that there's either time for questions or if not, then it's definitely time to go on to the next talk. Um, so I, I picked a, a very general title. That's usually the title I give people. And what do I want to talk about today in this, to this audience? Well, the general idea of quantum biochemistry, what I mean by that is using electronic structure methods, so using computational methods based on quantum mechanics to study biochemistry. Um, and if you don't know anything else about computational quantum mechanics, you probably know that it's quite expensive, so you need enormous amounts of computing time. Um, to do even, even small molecules. So can this, use, can this be used to study biochemistry? And yes, it can. Uh, the focus has mostly been on, on one thing, which is enzyme catalysis. And so because when you're making or breaking chemical bonds, that's quantum mechanics is really the only method that can handle that uh, without extensive parameterization. But increasingly, people are also using it for protein ligand binding. Uh, where you have especially strong binders that are very hard to describe using classical force fields because you have a lot of uh, very strong interactions that are slowly starting to look quantum mechanics or quantum mechanics like. Uh, and that can be very hard to treat um, classically. Okay, so we, we are doing this, uh, the community as a whole. Uh, and usually when we're doing this, we're doing it with something called QMMM. So the idea with that is it's a hybrid method where you have some quantum mechanics, so that's the red part here, for example, and then you have a force field, a classical force field for the rest. And the idea is very simple. You use quantum mechanics where you need it, uh, and then you use the cheap molecular mechanics force fields for the rest. Uh, and in general, that has worked really well, and there's a lot of studies now in enzymatic catalysis on this. Um, but it has some, there are some drawbacks to this. And I would say the main drawback is probably the MM parameters. So molecular mechanics force fields are cheap because you've done most of the work already uh, in describing the interactions. So uh, a lot of people here who, who are not quantum mechanics people have, may have used quantum mechanics to get new parameters for force fields. So here I'm, I'm thinking specifically about foreign or foreign looking ligands uh, that are not, where you don't have the atom type that you need right out, right out of the box. Or the atom type you get out of the box gives some funny behavior, and then you can go back and use quantum mechanics on small systems to fix it. Um, the main take home message here is that um, if your ligand is not standard, um, then there's a lot of fiddling with this in order to use a QMMM method. So QMMM methods are not black box. Uh, the other problem you have is that you have to define the boundary. You have to say what is QM and what is MM. Uh, and in principle, what you should do is once you've done a QM-MM study, then you should start over again with a bigger QM region to make sure that everything that is QM is actually done with QM. Uh, and with the current implementations of QM-MM, that actually means starting over again, completely from scratch. <coughs> so... Uh, it turns out that people have been working very hard on making quantum mechanics methods uh, run a lot faster, and there's actually been tremendous progress. Uh, and the, that's the so-called linear scaling methods that take advantage of parallel computing. And so you now can actually perform a quantum mechanical calculation on the entire protein. Uh, that's actually not that hard anymore. What's hard, and the reason that it hasn't really been used uh, for these two things, is that you can... It's not hard to do once, okay? But if you look at enzymatic catalysis and ligand binding, um, you have to do it many times because you have to optimize the geometry. You have to look for the transition state of your reaction and things like that. You have to relax the geometry so to minimize the energy. And these methods are still too slow to allow you to do that, right? So these methods are used, for example, in spectroscopy when you need to calculate the wave function where the electrons are once or twice, once before and once after the excitation. 
or for chemical shifts or things like that uh, where the geometry is static. But if the geometry moves, if you want to relax it, then you have, it, then you have to reevaluate these, these equations over and over again hundreds of times. And that's still too expensive. Uh, the advantage, of course, is that the, the parameters and the boundary and all that stuff disappears. So um, what I want to tell you a little bit about today is a hybrid of the two. So it's, it's a little bit QMMM. It's a little bit all QM linear scaling. And it's a little bit of a force field all mixed together. Um, and this is the work of a PhD student who has now graduated, Caspar Steinman, who is now at, uh, at SDU. Uh, and most of it has, well, all of it has been published. Uh, so again, you can go back and, and look at any of this if, if you're interested. And it's in collaboration uh, with Dmitry Fedorov in, in Japan. So this is a method that we, Casper basically wrote from scratch. Uh, so there's a few equations on the next slide, but, but the general idea is actually very simple. Um, a protein is too big to do a calculation on. And when I say protein, uh, I'm going to demonstrate it with a water cluster just because it's easier to think about, but it, this really works for proteins. So what we do with the protein is we cut it up in little pieces, okay? And each little piece we can do quantum mechanically very, very fast, okay? So that's what we do. So for example, if you have a water cluster, you, you do a quantum calculation on each, each water molecule. And that you can do very, very fast now. Uh, and what we get from this is a force field. So we, out of the wave function, we extract a force field. Uh, or part of a force field. So uh, a way, uh, one of the things, one of the important things is a force field are atomic charges. Okay, that you, that, that's one of the parameters that go into this. Now we calculate the charges, but also the dipoles and quadrupoles and, and, and very many other terms to give us a very, very detailed description of how the electrostatics are described in this system. And we also get something called dipole polarizabilities. That's what, that, that's something we need to describe the how the electron density or how, uh, is affected, how it's polarized by the other charges. So the bottom line is we're basically going to get a, a custom-designed force field for each little piece that we get out of this. And of course, we also, get the, we also get the energy of the system, the quantum mechanical energy. But the main point here is that we cut it into pieces, and for each piece, we design a custom custom force field specifically. So we, don't, we do it separately for each water molecule because each water molecule could have a tightly, slightly different geometry and therefore a slightly different force field. Okay? So that can be done very fast and of course that can be done parallel, right? You give a water molecule to each process. Uh, so that scales very well. Okay, and then we, then we calculate the polarization of the system. So how, how we induce dipoles on each of these pieces that are induced from the electrostatic field of the other pieces. Uh, so the main point here is that the main thing that force fields, current force fields lack is this polarization. The fact that the charges change depending on the environment. Okay, that's the kind of thing we're trying to, to model here. Okay, and that's a specific, uh, it's, it's from a, it's gonna be a, a theoretical point of view a little bit challenging because uh, it's nonlinear. That means that when I polarize this, that affects how this water molecule is polarized by that and vice versa. So we actually have to iterate on this until everything is, is polarized uh, exactly the way it should be. Okay? So the main point here is that it's, it's many body. We have the polarization of the entire system, but it's done purely classically. Okay. <coughs> So now we have the separate pieces. Now they need to interact with each other. Okay. And so things that are very close, like these two water molecules, they have a hydrogen bond. There, because there's a hydrogen bond, because the electron density overlaps, we need quantum mechanics to describe the short range interaction. Uh, so this is normally what in a force field would be, would be the Leonard Jones potential. Uh, but that here is treated exactly quantum mechanical. And that's because there are other things involved here than the Leonard-Jones potential, especially for strong interactions if you have charge groups binding each other. For example, there can be electron transfer charge 
uh, transferred from one fragment to the other. And the only way you can really describe that is with quantum mechanics. Okay, so basically for these short interactions, we say, okay, there we won't use the force field, we'll, we'll use the, the actual quantum mechanics. Okay, but when things are far apart, when they don't overlap, then we can use our, our classical force field. But we're using, again, a force field that's specifically designed for this fragment and for this fragment. And because it's specifically designed, and because we're using not just charges, but dipoles and quadrupoles and things like that, we get exactly the same energy that you would do as with quantum mechanics. It's no longer an approximation because the electron densities are no longer interacting. Okay. So there's no approximation anymore introduced by, by doing it classically because we use things other than, than charges. Okay, so that's, that's the water cluster. But, of course, for this audience, I have to very quickly now to start talking about proteins. So the, 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 main, the main problem with, with proteins from our point of view is that when you cut it up, you cut along covalent bonds or across covalent bonds. And so if you try to do a quantum calculation where you've cut a bond, that, that is going to cause you problems, right? Because it'll actually see the, the bond being cut and it'll try to do something about it. So the way we do it is basically we put a, a cork here on each side. So let's say we make a cut here and a cut here in order to keep the electrons where they should be, right, we freeze some of the electrons. So for example, this bonding orbital here and this bonding orbital here, that will be frozen. So that's not allowed to move. Okay, and that, because this electron density can't move, right, then this electron density can't go in to the other region where it shouldn't really go. <coughs> now, of course, that's an approximation Right, keeping that fixed. But what you have to remember is we'll go back and we'll do these dimer calculations quantum mechanically. Okay? So we will cut up the protein so each amino acid is a fragment, but we'll go back and do each pair that's covalently bonded. We'll do that quantum mechanically again and correct for this, this frozen bond. Okay. But Bottom line is here, when you, when you chop up a protein, that can be done, but you have to do something special at the boundary. So already it's becoming a little bit like a QMMM method in that we have boundaries, except the boundaries are sort of everywhere. But every boundary is fixed by a quantum mechanical calculation okay. on the fly. And it's fixed specifically for each time we cut. Okay. So what you have then is, in essence, the perfect force field from an accuracy point of view. Uh, it's, it's hard to do any better than, than what we have done. Okay? It's not so perfect from the computational time point of view, right? because you have to do a lot of quantum calculations. It's on small pieces, but you still have to, you still have to do it. So this is a very expensive force field, but it's one you could use to benchmark something. Uh, and I know people are already using similar methods to do that. But it's not something you're going to run a molecular dynamics simulation with. Or it's not something you're going to use for docking. Uh, and that's okay because that's not what it's designed to do. Uh, it's really designed to be a QMMM method from, from the outset. So it's a force field that's going to be perfect for a QMMM calculation. <coughs> Okay, and so what makes this QMMM? So the idea is now that we're going to apply this. We're still going to define two regions. For example, an active site, that's the active region, and then the rest, and we're going to call that the, the frozen region. Okay, and fr by frozen, I mean that we keep the geometry of that fix, that, that fix. So if you go and look in standard QMMM studies, you'll find that... Um, an awful big part of the protein is kept fixed when you calculate the barrier. Then you fix that by taking several different geometries and recalculating the barrier. But when you're actually calculating the barrier, you keep a lot of the, 
geometry fixed. Because, and you, go, you assume that the reaction is localized. And the reason you do this is, is basically for numerical stability. If you don't do that, you'll get terrible barriers. And the reason for that is that if you have a large protein and you allow everything to move when you're making your reaction happen in the active site, then you can have, for example, a hydrogen bond rearranging on the surface. Right? And that'll change the energy, and it'll look like that part of the energy change is the barrier. But in fact, it's not. It's just a hydrogen bond arranging on the surface that has nothing to do with the chemical reaction. And so the way you fix that typically is by freezing a lot of it. Okay. And so that's interesting for us because if you freeze something here, then we don't have to, then the force field doesn't change. And that means we only have to calculate the force field once. Okay? So if, again, if we're saying this is our active water, this is the water where we want to calculate the geometry or something, this is the water that's going to react, maybe this is the proton we're going to take off. We're going to calculate this in the presence of the rest of the water molecules, but the geometries are going to be frozen. That means that I have to calculate the force field once for these water molecules, and then it doesn't change anymore. Okay. So once I've calculated this force field once, which I can afford to do, then the cost of the calculation basically becomes the cost of calculating this water molecule over and over again. Okay. So it's exactly the same principle as a QMMM calculation. The cost is the same after the first step. Okay. So that's the, that's the clever part. You're probably wondering when the, when the clever part is going to show up, and this is it. <laughs> Okay, so basically the, the, the take-home message from this is, is a, is a state-of-the-art perfect force field for a QMMM calculation, okay, calculated specifically for the system, and once calculated, the cost is basically the same as a regular QMMM calculation. Okay, yep. Yeah. So what's the reason for level? Well... We use this level. So that actually, that's a very good question. That's actually one of the most important questions in this. What, what can you, at what point does the quantum mechanics become better than the force field? Because it's a lot worse if you don't use a good quantum mechanical level. And that's something um, we're struggling with. This is the first application we did on this. And so there we picked something that's not great, but not terrible. So for those of you who don't know what all this stuff means, it basically means that um, this is the way we describe the electrons, and this is the method we use to describe the electrons. And the difference between these two is that here we have dispersion, and here we don't. We, we say that that's an approximation. What this means is that the active site, the chemistry is done at a high level, and so that's the red's, uh well, that's, that's even less than the red stuff. So that's this little piece here, which is this piece here, where the reaction takes place. So you're breaking this bond, and you're forming uh, this bond. And so we're treating that at this level, and everything else is at the Hartree-Fock level. And what you see here in red, that's the region that's allowed to move that's the, that when, you, when you optimize the geometry. Okay, and the green is kept fixed. So, well, we made a choice of basis set. How does this compare to experiment? Well, before we can do that, uh, we need to correct for the fact that we're using a frozen geometry. Okay, in principle, the protein moves as the reaction proceeds. And so here we use this, the standard trick in QMMM. We run a molecular dynamic simulation using a classical force field, okay, with the whole protein. And then we, we take snapshots out of there with different geometries. And for every snapshot, we calculate the barrier. Okay, so that's what all these lines are, right? This is one snapshot. This is the barrier. This is another snapshot. This is the barrier. And the solid line is the average of all of these. Okay? And so when we take the average we get 18 kilocalories per mole, and the experimental value here is 13. Okay, so there is an error here. Yeah? 
that's a regular average because the, we assume because we run an MD that it's you get a, a Boltzmann distribution of structures. So, yeah. <coughs> uh, yep. So there's an error, and actually we picked this system because other people have done QMM calculations, and in fact you can, with the method, do a lot better. You can actually hit the experimental target exactly. And so the question is, why are we off in this? And we haven't studied it completely, but what it probably is is that when we optimize, when we find the, when we let the reaction proceed, we only let the red stuff move. And we probably need to let more stuff move to adjust to the reaction, right? Because, for example, when we run the MD, right, we run it with the reactant state, okay? But when we force the reaction to occur, right, the protein has to adjust to the transition state and then to the product. And there will be some rearrangement around the action state. Uh, the other culprit might be that we didn't pick a good level of theory here. And we've tested that a little bit, at least on this part, and that doesn't seem to make a big difference in this particular case. Yeah? Yeah. Yes. So actually, what a lot of, well, what was done in the what I would call the state of the art study, is that they built a guess at the transition state and sample around that. Yeah. So that's another way of doing it. But I also believe that if you give it enough freedom, if you let enough stuff move around, it can probably adjust. Yeah. So as you can see, we have a pretty wide spread of barriers. And that's probably because it's still too, it's still too rigid. Uh, yep. For in our the way our method is right now, it would be faster to sample. Yeah. In a normal QMMM method, it might be faster to let more optimize, because when you optimize, most of it is molecular mechanics again, so that optimization is fast. So the, the disadvantage with, sam with sampling around the transition state, they could do that in this case because they had an excellent idea what the transition state was because you could find it looks very similar to the one in solution. But many enzymatic reactions, the transition state will look completely different. And so what do you do if you can't make a model of it before you start? So, so that's a problem. Uh, so as you can see, it, this is, it's expensive. So th this is, each path here took four days on, on about 100 cores. So that was actually our main mission th in this case, was to show that with this method, you can actually, using only quantum mechanics, you can make it fast enough to do a proper study, right? You have to remember that at each point here, each little uh, break here, right? We've optimized the geometry using some constraints. Okay, and we did it seven times. There are 10 points, and each point probably took 50 steps. Right? So there's hundreds and hundreds of computational quantum chemistry calculations in order to get this average barrier. But you can actually do it now in a reasonable amount of time. Okay. So the next question now is how to make it more accurate. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of things um, to go from proof of concept to something that, that everyone can use. So, so there's some things missing. So one is the, the way we treat the solvent here is we take the solvent molecules from the MD simulation and put it in. But what we would also like to do is to put a, a, a solvent field around the entire thing. Uh, to treat the solvent as some solvent or the bulk of the solvent as a continuum. And the reason for that is basically a practical one that we found that, that things, the numerical stability gets a lot better if you put the solvent field around. And the reason is that you have a lot of charges sitting everywhere. 
and these charges are screened by the solvent, but you need a lot of water molecules and a lot of averaging to get the proper screening. And you can do that very cheaply with this continuum method that you put around. Okay. And I think that'll also help in, in reducing this spread here, right? Because this is, even though we have solvent molecules, it's still a bit like a gas phase calculation. And in the gas phase, charge interactions are 100 times stronger than the solution. So even a tiny little movement of a charged group right, can have a big effect on, on the barrier. Uh, if you have a transition metal, you need, un you need to be able to treat unpaired electrons. So that's a non-brainer. And if you want the enthalpy, and the free energy, then you also need the vibrational frequencies. And you need to know how they change as the reaction proceeds. Okay, so we need to calculate that. But I would say the, the main problem is that um, while a calculation like this is affordable, um, we, the main thing that makes it affordable now is that we have a relatively small region that can move and adjust. And making that region bigger is very expensive. And the reason it's expensive is because, we, remember, we have to do, go back and do all the pairs that are hydrogen bonding or touching each other. We have to do cal quantum calculations for all the pairs. And there's a lot of pairs. And when you make the system bigger, the number of pairs increases rapidly. So how would we, how would we do that? Um, so there are a couple of interesting new developments for quantum chemistry in general uh, that's going to have a lot of practical consequences, I think. And so uh, <clears throat> one is this fad, you could call it, of correcting quantum mechanical calculations uh, with something that looks like a force field. So that might sound like a very stupid idea, but in practice it turns out to be a really clever thing to do in many cases. So it started with dispersion. Uh, and density functional theory, many density functional functionals don't have dispersion in it. And so what you can figure out, what people found out is that if you add the dispersion in a classical way, just like a force field, but in a little bit more clever way, then things get a lot more accurate. And in fact, in many cases, you can get away with um, not doing any correlation at all not even doing DFT or even MTT. Okay. So the idea is that with relatively cheap wave functions like Hartree-Fox, so the cheapest possible, um, you, can, you can get hydrogen bonds and binding energies and things like that that are very close to experiments, that are very close to correlated to levels. Okay. So that's an, that's an exciting thing. What people then did was take the next step and said, well, if you can correct dispersion interactions, what else can you correct? Right? And the most important thing for us would be hydrogen bonds. Right? You really need to get those right in the biochemistry world. And so you can do that. That actually works. People have done it for semi-empirical methods and also now very recently for ab initio methods. Right? So if you use fast method, your hydrogen bonds look a little strange. But you can correct that with a very general and transferable, in a very general and transferable way. And then you get very good results. Okay. So now what has happened in the last year or two is you have very cheap methods like Hartree-Fock with a minimal basis set or a semi-empirical method like PM6, which is even faster somewhere in speed closer, I would say, to the weight, to the force field compared to the quantum mechanics. But they're starting to give you results that are almost as good as the best quantum mechanics you can do for some things, okay, but for some interesting things like hydrogen bonding and intermolecular interaction energies. Okay, so these methods basically, they are maybe 10 or 100 times slower than force fields, right? but almost as accurate in some cases as the best quantum mechanics you can do. So if you can do that, then you can afford 
to do geometry optimizations, not molecular dynamics, but geometry optimizations on relatively large systems. Okay? And you can then couple it to something like this, where you then, for the reacting part, right, where you probably need a little more computational uh, complexity, there you can go in and really do a good job. Okay, so that's, that's where we're headed with this. I would say we have a method that, that works, but a method that can be made a lot better. So thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. I think that's, well, high throughput docking is still very difficult. Yeah. yeah. But I think certainly in the last, <coughs> well, maybe this year, people have for the first time used methods like this to calculate near experimental accuracy binding free energies for small systems, model systems, uh, that are within one, maybe two kilocalories per mole of experiment. So, uh, in principle, with, with our kind of method, that can be transferred to, to proteins. So I think one could use a method like this to understand when docking fails, right? One can go in and figure out exactly why does it fail. Or in lead optimization, where you're not trying to do a million different things, but maybe a hundred different things, then it would probably become a practical thing to do. Yeah, so there's, there's, there's basically two, two cases. So this is all empirical. I mean, people have simply tried different things and compared with experiment. And the sample is kind of small, like maybe 10 or 20 reactions. But from that, it seems that if your MD is centered around the right minimum or the right kind of structure, then maybe between 10 and 20 snapshots is enough. Okay. Now, what, and the spread is kind of small. Now, what happens sometimes is that your MD starts in the wrong conformation, right? And then it moves to the right group of conformations. If you simply take an average, you'll get a horrible result. But if you go in and, and analyze the structure and basically cluster the structures and then do the average on what you think is the right cluster, then again, you're back to between 10 and 20 snapshots. But it's not black box. You can't just run 20 on average and that'll be enough. You have to carefully analyze the MD to make sure that it's all right. And of course, those are the only ones that are published, so those are the ones that worked. <laughs> I, I know that there are a couple more questions popping up, but I think we have to wait because we also have something to talk about in this break. And we have to keep doing it. So thank you again.